So welcome everybody back to the fall season of the quantum science seminar. Today is episode 16 and it's going to be all about quantum simulation with ultra cold atoms. Uh, as usual, we would like your questions. Please send us your questions by uh, email to quantum science seminar at gmail.com or you could use the YouTube live chat at the um, bottom of the screen. Uh, we are going to take a break somehow through the halfway through the talk and we're going to start answering some of these questions and then do another question session at the very end. Please, as always, note that there is a 30 second time delay between what you see and what we do. And with that, I actually have the honor of introducing our speaker today. So today we have Emanuel Bloch speaking, who is a director of the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Garching. And uh, Emanuel studied physics in Bonn and did his PhD with uh, Tetensch in Munich. He's worked with uh, Marcus Greiner and Tilman Esslinger on the superfluid to mod insulator transition, launched the field of quantum simulations uh, of condensed matter physics problems uh, using atoms and optical lattices. And since 2008, he is director of the quantum many body physics division at MPQ. Emmanuel, of course, has received many, many prizes uh, for his work, but I would also like to highlight that quite a few of them were for his excellent teaching. And uh, based on that, Emmanuel kindly agreed to try something new today. Uh, so after his talk, what we would like to do is we are going to share the Zoom link that we're working on. And if uh, any of you guys have questions that you would like to ask in person or would like to interact with the speaker a bit, we're going to share that Zoom li link at the end of the talk in the YouTube chat. And then you're welcome to log in and uh, talk to all of us. And with that, I would like to hand over to Emmanuel and give him a warm welcome for episode 16. Okay, thanks a lot, Sebastian, and thanks a lot to the Quantum Science Seminar organizers for, for having me here to start the fall session of the super successful Quantum Science Seminar. It's been really amazing to see that, and now to be myself part of it is, of course, a, a great pleasure. So today I want to talk a little bit about our, our experiments uh, in Munich on quantum simulations. I'll just focus on one topic today, which is on fermionic quantum matter. Uh, but a little bit touch what's going on on the sides and how we're trying to push the frontiers of, of quantum simulations uh, with our setups. Actually, this picture, if you, Sebastian has been hosting many of these videos and uh, this actually a view into Sebastian's lab. I don't know if you'll see more of it, but this picture that you see actually here on the front is one of uh, Sebastian's labs where actually Sebastian's strontium experiment is running. Um, so let me get started uh, and tell you a little bit what I want to talk about today. So I want to give you a little bit uh, of an introduction into the field of quantum simulations with ultra cold atoms, especially optical lattices, and talk focus in the talk today on this one topic on, on quantum gas microscopy of the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, simply, I think it's because one of the most interesting problems uh, we can work on in these systems and also because it's kind of a benchmark problem for all kind of you know, quantum simulators, quantum computers that want to study you know, material science problems. This is kind of the reference problem you want to work on basically. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, what you can do in these, in these systems. Okay, so let me get started and to tell you about optical lattices, if you've never heard what these optical lattices are. Here's actually a beautiful photograph from uh, Ted Henge, where he basically took a single laser beam, um, sent it to these apertures that you can see down here, just these five holes here in this uh, pentagon, and then use the lens behind that to focus those beams down. And of course, you all know what's going to happen is that uh, you're going to get multiple beam interference. And out of this five-fold pattern, you actually get this beautiful five-fold symmetric interference pattern that you actually see on the screen. That's the interference pattern created by light. And this kind of interference pattern by light, this kind of optical lattice is what our atoms can experience as a optical potential. So our challenge is now to put them into a vacuum chamber, make them extremely cold and load them very gently into these feeble uh, optical potentials and hold them there and study some of the physics, what these atoms, interacting atoms are doing in these optical potentials. We typically do this, as you'll see, with very few particles. We can go down to one, two, three, four, up to thousands of particles, as you'll also see in the talk. Uh, we can also do this basically with spin systems, where we model qubits. Uh, we have quantum spin systems. But I think one big strength of this platform is also you can directly model particle Hamiltonians 
like bosonic Hamiltonians, fermionic Hamiltonians, where you simulate electrons, for example, in a material or mixtures of both. And of course, we're trying to push this into regimes where it also gets really hard for classical computers to show a, you know, what people call quantum advantage about in these, in these, in these systems. Actually, if you want to see how these uh, interference patterns were made, I actually urge you to go to the YouTube channel of Ted Hench. Uh, his username is superlaser123. And so you can all have a look how these interference patterns were made. Actually, beautiful other optics videos there that are really fun to watch. And uh, okay, as you see, you know, we need to increase the subscriber number to make him a 1 million YouTube uh, subscriber. But I think if you know a lot of you go there, we'll, we'll, we'll head towards that goal. Okay, let me talk about quantum gas microscopy, uh, a new technique that was introduced a few years ago on how we can uh, basically observe single atoms uh, in these systems and manipulate single atoms in these, in these systems. And the idea is the following, and that actually generally applies to all kinds of uh, quantum simulators, whether they are done with ions, superconducting chips, or the atoms. But let's imagine we are able to create some ground state of a Hamiltonian, and we denote uh, this state by this uh, psi. Uh, then this would, of course, be a superposition of different configurations of our particle in the system. Of course, there would be complex coefficients in front of that uh, that tell us the amplitudes of these states. And let's imagine we take a photograph of one of these uh, systems. Uh, with high resolution, with single lattice site resolution and single atom sensitivity. And what's going to happen then is basically that the state collapses onto one of those configurations. Which one you're going to get in the single run of the experiment is completely random. You cannot predict that. Uh, of course, the probabilities are given by the norm squared of the complex coefficients uh, of the amplitudes. And uh, so this is, for example, in one shot of the experiment, the configuration you see. Then of course you don't have the original state psi anymore. You have to recreate psi by going through the whole cooling sequence, preparation sequence again. Then you measure again, and then you get maybe another configuration. And then you repeat this thousands, tens of thousands of times. And eventually what you get is a probability distribution of these configurations of these different particle configurations. And from these configurational uh, probability distributions, you can actually reconstruct correlation functions that tell you something about the physics in these strongly interacting particle systems. And uh, what this gives us actually is access to microscopic correlations that have previously not been accessible in typical condensed matter experiments. You can beyond, go beyond standard two-point correlation functions. You can, for example, ask questions, how is this particle here correlated with these two over here, conditioned on having a hole in the middle? That's already a three-point correlation function. That's something you cannot measure. Uh, you might ask, why do I even want to know that? Well, as I'll actually show you in the last part of my talk, uh, all, all throughout the talk, these are absolutely fundamental to actually reveal some of the important physics of these strongly correlated systems. They manifest themselves in these higher order correlation functions, and they are the distinguishing features, how we can distinguish between several of them. So here's a picture of how this typically works. We create, for example, a single plane, two-dimensional plane in which the atoms can move. Uh, then we have lattices in the X and Y direction created by these interfering laser beams. And then when we want to see the atoms, we scatter resonant light off them. So they light up, they fluoresce, and we detect the fluorescence image with a very good objective with a high numerical aperture. And if you do everything right, you see images like this one, for example, a thermal gas where each bright spot that you can see here is actually a single atom that you can see in the system. Um, you can also go beyond that. If you can uh, see particles with single particle and uh, single site resolution, you also have the ability to manipulate them with a single site um, resolution. So you can focus a laser beam in the reverse direction to the objective and pick a single atom and rotates its spin, for example. And we did that here as an example, just to create different patterns, this square, this line, a star, or this uh, psi out of 26 individual atoms. The white points mark the lattice sites and the orange fluorescent spots, these are each individual atom sitting on those lattice sites. And we can do address particles on these lattices with a resolution of about uh, 50 nanometers in the system. So much better than the optical wavelength we're using to address those particles around uh, 800 nanometers. So uh, recently we've been working a lot on producing much more flexible potentials um, that 
you can use with these systems, make it more programmable, the whole approach. And for that, we're making use a lot of these digital mirror devices. I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, actually to project arbitrary light patterns onto the atoms, maybe a line of light and exotic lattice, uh, two reservoirs that you could connect by a one-dimensional wire of light. Uh, this is something that, for example, Tilman Esslinger has been studying very successfully in his Zurich experiments. Or you can make box potentials, and I'll actually give you an example of that, where you remove the harmonic trap and you make a completely homogeneous system and uh, basically avoid also any, any other confinement effects that you have in the system. Um, you have to fight a little bit speckle. I'll come uh, back what we do about that at the end of the talk. So here's actually an example of what you can do. You can, for example, put this uh, DMD, which is just an array of micro mirrors that each mirror you can turn on and off. You can tip and tilt, you can turn on and off. So if the, if, if the pixel is white, the mirror is, is on. If the, mirror, the, the pixel is black on this image, the mirror is off. And like that, you can create grayscale images like this one, which from which we reflect the uh, laser, for example, a Gaussian laser beam. Yeah? And this Gaussian laser beam then creates a, a light field, which corresponds to this uh, DMD pattern. And this light field is then shown onto the atoms. And then, for example, in this case, what it allows us to do is basically make arrays of quantum ladders, so coupled to one dimensional systems where you have a quantum ladder here, another quantum ladder here, another quantum ladder here, here, and this is a single shot. And you have some atoms actually also you see outside of the box. And uh, this is basically a single snapshot of the system. When you take many of the shots, you average, you get the average, uh, for example, density distribution, and you can see you've completely removed the harmonic confinement. You're basically working with an average density of one in these systems entirely over the entire system size. So this allows you to make uh, flexible potentials. I told you about the ladders already. Here's a zoom into those ladders. We can terminate the ladder uh, with different ends. So instead of just having another lattice, fill lattice site here, we can block this lattice site and this lattice site to make a unit cell, which is now oriented diagonally instead of vertically, if you would have another lattice site here. And that actually has profound effects, for example, of the interacting topological phases you have in the system. Another thing we're pushing now is actually towards larger system size. And here I want to show you some cool new images from our rubidium quantum gas microscope experiment, where we basically now basically flatten the potential. We make a box potential. And we now have system sizes on the order of 50 by 50 at a flatter sites, so about 2,500 atoms, which fill these box potentials. We're getting close to unit filling, as you'll see. And we're working as we speak. We're working on perfecting these systems. And this shows you also how we can push towards larger systems on the few thousand particle scales. And I'll comment actually how we plan to go even further to the few 10,000 particle system sizes in the future. Yeah? So this is all done with this um, box potential, with this um, DMD approach of shaping the potential in the system and enlarging system sizes. So the topic I want to talk about today is this material science problem, this Fermi Hubbard model, where you basically have spin up and down particles denoted by these blue and red balls moving around in our lattice, which is going to be a square lattice. Actually, they move with some hopping amplitude t. They interact with each other through a collisional interaction u, which we can control via so-called Feshbach resonances. And if we fill every of those lattice sites uh, with one atom and go to strong repulsive interactions, we can actually show that this model actually maps onto another model, which is a spin model, uh, which is basically the Heisenberg model with antiferromagnetic interactions where this J is positive. So in the ground state of this Hamiltonian would be where these spins on neighboring lattice sites align um, antiferromagnetically. So this is a system that is very important in the context of high TC because it's believed to be the fundamental Hamiltonian containing the essential physics of high TC. And here's a kind of phase diagram of high TC compounds where you have temperature here, you have doping of the high TC compounds and you see this zoo of phases, actually this taken from a review paper from Bernard Keimer. And uh, basically, of course, we cannot capture all of this uh, physics, but we'll actually see that many of these aspects we do have also in our systems. We're still working uh, around elevated temperatures compared to this phase diagram, but as you see, already interesting stuff is happening here, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. So when you introduce holes into the system, dopants, hole doping, so you remove electrons out of the real material, or you remove 
atoms out of our artificial system, you dope the system. And what we're going to learn is that now what happens is that you're going to have a competition between the kinetic energy of the whole wanting to delocalize and on the other hand, the magnetic order. So that's the essential physics that drives all of the interesting stuff. It sounds simple enough, uh, but actually we'll see, actually this is very complex and a lot of this physics of what's happening there is not, not understood until this day. Okay, let me uh, go back a little bit step and, and recap for the Fermi Hubbard model. Uh, actually 2016, 17 was a fantastic uh, year, two years in the community where there were actually many experiments uh, that demonstrated fermionic quantum gas microscopes uh, to see, to probe this Fermi Hubbard physics in the system. Here's actually a very beautiful experiment from Markus Kainer's group in, in Harvard, where they basically looked at the antiferromagnetic ordering you get at zero doping. So you have this one atom per site, 50% spin ups, 50% spin downs. And remember the Hamiltonian you had was in Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And now you want to show that there is this antiferromagnetic ordering. So how do you do that? A priori, our imaging is not spin selective. So when you take an image like the one here in Marcus experiments, you don't see where the spin up or the spin down is in the system. But uh, Marcus applied a kind of a nice trick, basically removing one spin component, let's say the spin down component, you are left with the spin up component. And then you know that each time you see a hole, that was actually a spin down particle in the system. Okay, and like that, you get a spin sensitive detection. But of course, this only works if you don't have too many holes in the system. If you're working in a strongly doped regime, you cannot be sure whether the hole you're seeing is actually a, a true hole or is actually a spin down particle. But in the undoped case, it, it's, it's unambiguous. And then you can measure spin-spin correlation functions. And you see that if you go to low enough temperatures, you see this beautiful antiferromagnetic correlations emerge in the system, which die out for higher temperatures. So as you are working at low enough temperatures, you see this nice antiferromagnetic order. So the question, the challenge for us was, how can we actually do this in a way where we can avoid these problems, where we can see in each single snapshot which particle is spin up, which is spin down, where is a hole and where is a doubly occupied site in the system. So I want to introduce you to our technique of this spin and density resolved imaging in our system. So imagine you have a single plane where you have uh, spin ups and downs and holes and doublons uh, in the system and you want to see where they are. So what we're gonna do in the experiment is the following trick. We're going to separate those two planes into one plane which contains only the spin up particles and another plane which only contains the uh, spin down particles. So spin up particles move in the upper plane, we move it up, the spin down particles into the lower plane, they move down. And then we take uh, first an image of the lower plane and focus with our microscope objective. Then we move the lens to bring our other system, our other plane into focus and make a measurement of the other plane of the system. And like that, we get two photographs of the system and we can combine them to get the full spin and density distribution of the system. So how does this work? How do we do this separation and the splitting of the spins into two planes? Well, basically we uh, rely on having a very stable super lattice setup formed by two wavelengths at 1064 nanometers and 532 nanometers, where we have full phase and frequency control and amplitude control between those two waves. And what we can do then is the following trick. Imagine you are looking at a single plane in the Z direction we want to split it, right? We want to split the spin ups go up, spin downs go down. And now they're occupying the same single lattice plane of the original physical system. So what we're gonna do now first is we're going to apply a magnetic field gradient. We're going to introduce a double well through this short space lattice. So the spin down is pulled into the upper plane, the spin up into the lower plane. That's the first thing. So we separate a single plane into two adjacent planes. And then we do a modulation of the super lattice parameters in the following way, that we basically do this, uh, what we call a charge pumping or spin pumping in the system that allows us to separate those two planes from each other, increase the separation in each pumping cycle. And because this is a topologically protective process, it actually works with extremely high efficiency. So if you, for example, make snapshots uh, with absorption imaging from the side of your atomic plane, you start out with a single atomic plane down here. 
And after a first few steps, you've separated them, then you pump a bit more, you separate them more, or here we've even separated those two planes, which you can now view from the side, basically over a distance of 30 micrometers. And that's now a large enough distance to basically focus, have the depth of focus be sufficiently different for the two planes when we actually image them. So this works actually quite nice. So we have the monolayer, you split it, you charge pump it, and then you take the two photos like, uh, like you see here, and you get the spin ups in the upper plane, the spin downs in the lower plane. And when you combine it, you get the original configuration of your single plane where you now know uh, without doubt where the spin ups, downs, holes, doublons were. So you have full spin and charge resolution. And this is really essential for what I'm actually going to tell you in the subsequent part of the talk that we can fully identify holes and spins. Huh? Because actually remember our goal was to learn what is the interplay of these mobile holes, the dopants, with the magnetic background. So we have to identify what the holes are doing onto the magnetic background and vice versa, how the magnetic background is reacting onto those holes. Uh, you actually, just to show you that this method works nice, we, we of course just tested on the simple case of the undoped system and we also see these nice uh, anti-ferromagnetic cor correlations at, at similar temperatures to what Marcos has seen in this first experiment that I've, that I've shown you before. Okay, actually we could have a quick stop here on the techniques before we go more on the physics, if that's okay. It's a bit early, but maybe there are some questions on the, on the uh, actually already experimental setup on the techniques that, that people want to know more about before we continue with the physics. Yes, thank you, Emmanuel. So we have a few uh, questions for you already. So we have a first question from V. Phillips, uh, who is interested to know more about your uh, lens, which has an aperture of 0 0.60 weight, if you can say more about it. Uh, what does he want to know more about it? Well, it, this one has been long in our setup. So this one, it's actually what you see is pretty much the actual lens setup. So this was uh, at the time, uh, a kind of a complex construction that we went through. Uh, um, and, and with, but yeah, I'm not sure what I can say more about the objective than what it does. So it just has a, this is multi-lens component objective with this resolution of around 700 nanometers, uh, which uh, allows us basically resolve um, not quite exactly the, the single atoms on the sides. If you actually go, if you actually see the image I showed you here, this one, you see when you have one atom per side, it looks like a homogeneous fluorescence that you see. So you can't really separate uh, the atoms from each other. But the fact that you know that this is a lattice, that atoms only occupy lattice positions, allows you to reconstruct, even from images like this one, the full lattice configuration in this 50 by 50 array. So this, this image, actually the right one here, this was taken with this uh, um, lens and numerical aperture of uh, 0.68. Okay, so we have a second question from Ian Despard that is asking so if you can say more about uh, the limits uh, on, the, on the possibility to realize unit filling, especially, I mean, this can be important to know for, for a, a larger uh, system size. Yes, so typically we, I mean, it's a little bit, it's, it depends a little bit how hard, we, how much effort we put into it. Uh, we can routinely get to 97, 98% filling not here yet, you can see these pictures are not 97, 98% filling. These are just first shots of these larger systems that we're making right now in the lab, but I'm pretty sure we'll get to those in a few weeks uh, down the line. We'll have them also with those fillings. Uh, if we want to push higher, that is more challenging uh, because uh, you also have to reduce the temperature in the system. So these are just thermal defects basically occurring in these systems. Okay, and then we have a second question from Ms. Phillips that is going to be maybe the last question for this first stop. And so he asked that, let's see that most methods for making spin system half up and half down, so we produce a distribution of up and down. So mm -hmm. can, can you say more about it? Oh, absolutely. We'll come back to that. We make use of this. This is a single snap. The pictures I showed you, these are single snapshots, right? These are, sorry, let me go forward in the, so this picture is a single snapshot of the spin configuration in the system. So now, of course, we're going to make use of, we have to repeat the experiment, take thousands, 10,000s of images like this one, and then analyze them, for example, for correlation functions, spin correlations, spin fluctuations in the system. And these will be, of course, important. This is exactly the physics we're interested in. Uh, this is just a single snapshot. 
And that's that will change. That will change from shot to shot a lot, actually. And now it's up to us to analyze the right correlation functions. Okay. So thank you. I think we can continue with the talk. We are going to get uh, more questions for later on. Excellent. Good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the physics. Let's start actually with a very simple process, but a very fundamental phenomena in condensed matter physics, uh, which is the so-called process of spin charge fractionization, which uh, actually you know, is well known in condensed matter physics, but we can observe for the first time with real space and time resolution here. So the idea is the following, a very fundamental problem. You, you have an electron, for example, it has two quantum numbers, the charge minus E and the spin one half. And of course we know that this is an undivisible particle in free space. We cannot separate the electron into two particles, one carrying the charge and one the spin. Now, actually what happens if you inject such an electron into a special condensed matter system, then this can happen. The system can fractionalize into two quasi-particle excitations in the system where one of them carries the charge only and one of them carries the spin and they actually separate over arbitrary distances. And this is called fractionalization. And if they can separate over arbitrary distances, we call this deconfinement because spin and charge are kind of not stuck together. They can move independently. And before in the original electron, they were confined to the same electron. So a system where this actually works very well is a one-dimensional Heisenberg antiferromagnet. You already learned uh, when we get these 1D Heisenberg antiferromagnets, that's uh, when we have the undoped Fermi-Hubbard model, it's strong repulsive interactions. Here are the spin-spin correlations for such a system taken in the experiment and you see the nice antiferromagnetic correlations. Note that even at t equals zero in 1D, you would not get like constant order correlation like in higher dimensional systems uh, because we're in the 1D system, even at t equals zero, this would be an algebraic decay. Uh, but on top of that in our system, finite temperature superimposes an exponential decay on this correlation function. And here's kind of an image single snapshot of that. But now we want to do this experiment in this 1D system. So we could inject an electron into this cartoon picture of a Heisenberg antiferromagnet, or alternatively, you can also remove an electron from the system, which is basically the same thing as injecting an anti-electron with the spin into the system. And then we see what happens. And in this cartoon picture, you already see what dynamically happens as time evolves, basically, you're going to get two excitations now. One is this hole moving, for example, to the right. This is what we call a holon. It has a charge of a missing particle, missing electron, and relative to the background, this has a charge plus E. And over here, these two neighboring spins form another type of quasi-particle purely in the magnetic sector of the system, which has a spin quantum number of one half, and that's the so-called spinon. And they can actually separate independently and arbitrary over different distances. So, and they actually also move with different velocities because they are different excitation modes of the many body system. And we can, we can look at that. Uh, I should first say that this kind of phenomena of spin charge uh, separation was, was seen in spectroscopic data in solid state experiments, most notably in the ones of Amir Jacobi at Harvard. And actually already early on in our field, uh, numerical simulations pointed to the fact that if you could see that with single site resolution, you could actually see that phenomena also uh, with, uh, with, with cold atoms. So here's what we do. Uh, let me walk you through this graph. So we inject a hole at time zero. Time is on the vertical axis, position on the lattice in the x direction. You inject a hole into the system and you see how that hole moves. And actually you see, actually it starts out at this site where we removed it and then spreads out. And actually you see some interference structure in between. And that's just the hole making a quantum walk on the lattice. So there's nothing really very exciting about it. It's just the hole doing its quantum walk. We can also look for the spin, for the spin-spin correlator, neighboring spin correlator, and look how that propagates. And you see actually that that actually also makes a cone. There's no visible interference pattern in between simply because our temperatures are a little bit too elevated to see any kind of interference structure there. But there's clearly something spreading out. So we can just take you know, the width of that thing that's spreading out and plot it as a function of time. And then we see that for the hole and for the spin, we get two very different uh, propagation velocities corresponding to those two quasi-particle excitations. This is the holon moving with its velocity, and this is the spinon moving with its other velocity. 
Now, one unique feature of the quantum gas microscope is, as I said, it allows you to measure these higher order correlators. Uh, so far, pretty much standard correlation functions we looked at. But we can look at something special here, which tells us much more about this fractionalization process. And this is this three point correlator. Let me walk you through this slowly. So we're looking at the spin orientation in the Z direction on site I minus one, how that correlates with the spin orientation on site I plus one. So here and here, conditioned on having a hole in between. So we're looking, what is the spin environment? How are the spins correlated around a hole? Yeah? And if we initially remove a hole uh, non-adiabatically out of the system with our laser beam and blast it out, then for an antiferromagnetic system, we would expect this correlator to be initially positive. But as time goes on, as this hole moves away from the spinon and spinon propagates in the other direction, you see actually that the spin correlator around the hole will actually turn from positive initially to negative when the hole on has moved away from the spinon and the spinon has been over here. So initially you kind of have the situation where the spinon indicated by these two upspins is attached still to the hole on simply because they were created you know, at the same point in space. But now they can move independently and now they can separate and they can move away from each other. And that's actually a very new and very clear signature of this fractionalization process happening in the system. And this is indeed what we see. So this is this three point correlator, spin hole spin correlator. It starts out positive at time t equals zero, then becomes negative. And then because of the trap in our system, it settles to a slightly less negative value here, background value in the system, but still stays negative. Uh, telling us that the spinon has moved away from the holon, which is now surrounded uh, by an antiferromagnetic environment. Okay, uh, actually, let me skip this part. Let me connect this physics that we saw in the dynamics of the system to actually a very interesting order, hidden order that we find in the ground state of this of this many-body 1D system. So we go to this uh, 1D system of spin ups and downs and holes. And we want to find a ground state. And now we remember we have two things that are competing with each other. We have the hole, which you know, is any particle in order to minimize its kinetic energy wants to delocalize. And then we have the spins on the other hand and the spins they want to align antiferromagnetically because of this antiferromagnetic coupling into the system. Question is how can you satisfy those two conditions in an optimal way? What's the best ground state you can form? And it turns out the best ground state you can form, the lowest energy state you can form is the following one, where the hole is in a superposition of being everywhere completely delocalized in the system to minimize kinetic energy. And the spins are actually aligned antiferromagnetically around this hole, rather than ferromagnetically if we would have just kicked, kicked one particle. So if you think of a single hole, what it actually does, it basically creates a domain wall in the system, a non-local, as we say, topological excitation. I'll explain why we call it like that, where when you start out to have some kind of antiferromagnetic order, down, up, down, up, whenever there comes a hole, this order is flipped to the reverse direction, okay? Because around the hole, the spins want to align antiferromagnetically. Why do we call this a non-local topological excitation? Well, you see, because even 100 sites away from this original defect, the particles ordering here will feel the effect of this single hole. Yeah? So usually when we insert holes into a higher dimensional system, it only has a very local effect of uh, changing the properties of the system. But in the 1D system, you know, even far away, you sense this kind of hole uh, like this domain wall that appears in the system. So if you want to say that this single hole is basically like a parity kink in this antiferromagnetic background that you have. And we can measure that. So again, let me show you, let me walk you slowly through that uh, graph, the experimental signal. So here we're measuring again the spin hole spin correlator. So the spin configuration around holes. But now we are measuring it, uh, the spins not just next neighbor to the hole, we're measuring the spin here on site I, then the spin uh, at site I plus D. So let's say we take this spin here and we correlate it with the spin D away from that. And then we condition it on having a hole at position I plus S. 
Now, S can have the following two situations. Either the hole sits beyond the two spins, so there isn't in between them, or the hole sits between the two spins. And as I said, this should have a profound impact on the, on the spin correlation because each time there is this hole, it flipped the spin configuration. So let's have a look at that. Here's the distance between the two spins I'm correlating on the x-axis. Here's the position of the hole on the y-axis. So we start out, for example, with uh, S being smaller uh, than D, and we see kind of a certain type of antiferromagnetic ordering, or let's say we start with S larger than D, where we have this down, up, down, up, down, up correlation. And now when we go to the situation where S is smaller than D, so we cross this diagonal, you see how every point in red is flipped to blue and every point in blue is flipped to red, indicating that the parity is exactly changed. I can make this even more visible if I take out this alternating staggering by just introducing this minus one to the power of D uh, to the distance between the two systems uh, to reveal the parity of the background. And you see how the parity of the blocks that you're correlating is really sign reversed whenever you introduce a hole into the system, even over larger distances. So now that you understood what a single particle does, a single hole, actually you know everything about the system to know what many, many holes do. There's not really much more to learn. Each time there's a hole, there's a parity flip in the antiferromagnetic background, which we indicate here by plus one going to minus one, to plus one to minus one. And uh, so if you would not know where the holes are, if you had a fluctuating number of holes here, you would ha actually have a problem in telling me how this spin is correlated with this one, because each time there's a hole, you know, this, 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 this order is kind of reversed. But if you stare at this image a bit longer and you look at it, you actually see something very simple in this model, that if you would go to a fictitious squeezed space where you remove the holes out of the system, then you see you actually recover the perfect Heisenberg antiferromagnetic uh, system of the undoped model. So in this fictitious squeeze space, where you just squeeze out the holes, you get a nice perfect antiferromagnetic ordering, which is however not visible to you in standard two-point correlation functions. And this actually points to a very fundamental thing in the ground state of this 1D Fermi Hubbard model, uh, namely spin charge fractionalization, spin charge separation manifesting itself as a fundamental phenomena on the many body wave function level. So if I write down the many body wave function of this 1D system, it actually factorizes into a charge or density part, which denotes where my electrons or atoms sit on the lattice. And then there's a wave function part for the magnetic order, which lives on this fictitious squeeze space lattice, uh, where we basically remove those holes and we have this perfect Heisenberg uh, antiferromagnet. So this factorization into this density part and spin part is a very, very special feature of this 1D system and lies also at the heart of the dynamical property of fractionalization that we saw before. You can reveal this order also by looking at a so-called non-local uh, spin correlator by basically correlating this spin here with the spin over here. But you have to, to reveal any correlation, you have to make sure that each time there's a hole, you reverse the sign of this correlator by minus one. Uh, that's, that's absolutely crucial, otherwise you would not see that order. So let me show you that, that it works in the experiment. So you start out with the uh, neighboring spins, spins right next to each other, and you're then uh, looking at larger distances and you're doping the system with degrees of doping from 20% to 80% doping. So we can have many holes. Now, if the distance is one, there can be no hole in between, right? Because there's just no space to put a hole. So this is kind of naturally negative. But then as we can start to put fluctuating number of holes in there, if I just look at the two point correlator, you see that just gives us a flat line. And that's what you would measure kind of in standard kind of condensed matter experiments. So you see, you cannot see this order or this magnetic order that's in the system. If you would see that as an experimentalist, you would say there is no uh, magnetic ordering in the system. If we evaluate this string correlator, on the other hand, we take into account for these holes, then you actually see how this flips up and down and uh, basically reveals this antiferromagnetic ordering in the system, in this strongly doped system. All right. Um, let me move on uh, going from 1D to the more interesting setup of 2D, but the question remains the same. Just the physics, as you'll see when we go from 1D to 2D, completely changes, actually. Uh, and the question we ask now is, again, we have a 2D antiferromagnet. We put a single hole in there. 
what does this single hole do to this antiferromagnetic background? And you might ask, well, you know, uh, this is a very hypothetical question. It is but it's one that really some of the greatest minds in condensed matter physics have worked on. Here's a paper from uh, Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and Nick Reed, actually from already 1989, where they ask this question of the motion of a single hole in this Heisenberg quantum antiferromagnet we're seeing. And uh, that just shows you that this is a complex question and remains uh, difficult today. So let's go to the 2D system, understand what's going on there. So in 2D, let's, instead of putting a hole, put a doublon. Uh, essentially, it behaves the same as a hole, but for practical reasons, we like to work here with doubly occupied sites as, as dopants. And now we ask, what does that thing do now if it starts moving around? Now, what you see what's different in 2D is if this doublon starts to move, hop from this side to this side, it will leave behind a string of flipped spins paramagnetically aligned spins. If it moves more, it leaves behind even more ferromagnetic aligned spins. And uh, this basically costs it a lot of magnetic energy because remember, spins wanted to align antiferromagnetically. So if you keep on moving, you know, you will have to pay a lot of energy costs and you, the, the, the doublon doesn't have that energy. Yeah? So the question is, what can the, the doublon do you know, to find the optimum solution in the 2D system? So in 1D, remember we had separation of spin and charge, completely separation. In 2D, the situation is very different. In 2D, what happens is that you basically have these dopants, holes or doublons, and they create around themselves a bubble of, um, well, in the very strong case of ideally ferromagnetic spins yeah, or reduced antiferromagnetic order, where in this bubble, they can move a little bit easier without paying the magnetic energy cost, but they can only do that over a certain range where they can kind of lose kinetic energy, but that cost has to be paid in, you know, paying the price in ordering those spins around this impurity different. And that solution is uh, called the polaron, a magnetic polaron that exists in the antiferromagnetic background around this single impurity. So you're not surprised, you would not surprised to learn that uh, actually, if you want to calculate the size, what is the size of this uh, polaron? Actually, it will be a competition of kinetic energy, which is given by the parameter T here and the magnetic energy cost in the system, which is given by J here. And if you work it out uh, on, a, on a few lines on a paper, you actually would come up that this should scale with the fourth root uh, of the ratio T over J. If you do a little bit more refined picture, like what Fabian has done with Eugene and Demler in Harvard, you come up that this is kind of more precisely one third, but very weak dependence actually on this ratio of a kinetic to magnetic energy cost. So here are pictures now in 2D where we can image this polaron around this magnetic impurity. So we, for the first time, get a real space photograph of how this mobile impurity affects the spin background around it. And uh, so here's uh, the doublon. When we take the picture, actually remember this doublon is mobile. We don't know where it's going to show up in the system. It can appear at any position in our 2D lattice. So, and then we take a photo in the photo. We also see where the spin ups and downs are. And now we take thousands of such images. We recenter them on where we found the impurity in those images. And that allows us to plot basically this three point correlator, which is how are the spins aligned between this bond on this bond, conditioned on having a hole in the center or a double on in the center. So now we can see if we plot the correlation strength of that bond, you see that in the vicinity of this uh, mobile impurity, you see this modification compared to the background signal when you go further away. Uh, so this is indeed the polaron forming. It's even more striking if you look at the diagonal correlators, which compared to the background in the vicinity of this mobile impurity, uh, show a complete sign reversal from positive uh, to negative in the system and basically allow us to probe the structure, the microscopic, microscopic structure of, of this polaron. And what you needed, remember, was to see holes and spins simultaneously. So you can only do these kind of experiments if you have full spin and density resolution of your microscope in your detection. Okay, I just want to very briefly, because we're coming close to the end uh, of the talk, I would just want to show you something that's going to appear soon on the archive from us how you can put that to use in this interesting phase diagram of, of, of the cuprates of the Fermi-Hubbard model. 
So I showed you this phase diagram. Remember, we have temperature on the vertical axis, doping on the horizontal axis. And uh, what people know is that in the regime of very low dopants, as I just explained to you, we get these polarons that form on top of the antiferromagnetic background. And actually this system now forms a metal where the charge carriers are the polarons, the holes that we introduced into the system, okay? So that we have the positively charged holes that form the charge carriers in this metal, in this polaronic metal that forms over here. In the regime of very strong doping, on the other hand, we actually find in condensed matter experiments a different metal. There's also a metal over here, a Fermi liquid, but where now the charge carriers are not the holes, they're just the standard electrons in the system. So if you have very, very strong dopings, uh, very low electron density in the system in the end, you just form a more or less standard metal. So you have a crossover somewhere here in between from this very strange non-Fermi liquid metal. People also call this a strange metal uh, because it shows properties that are not akin to, to normal metals into this standard Fermi liquid here metal. And we'd like to see when that actually happens. Where, where at this doping level does that happen? And to do that, we actually looked at several, several correlation, cor correlators in the system, two-point spin correlators, uh, the spin correlators conditioned on having a hole here, which tells us how does the polaron itself evolve as a function of doping? How does it break down? How does it break up? Uh, and actually, we want to also see, can we see effects maybe of binding between two holes that would be precursor effects maybe to, you know, superconductivity, Cooper pairs forming in this, in this Fermi-Hubbard model. So that's why we're interested in knowing what two holes that come close to each other actually do on the spin background. So this is a two-point correlator, spin-spin. That's a three-point correlator, spin-spin conditioned on a hole. And that's a four-point correlator, spin-spin conditioned on having two holes in a certain configuration in the system. And all of these we, we measure and we look at, and I, I just maybe want to just glimpse over just a few, uh, two results, just to show you on the two-point signal, we see this very interesting effect that this antiferromagnetic order, which is signalized by this, um, structure factor, if we Fourier transform our correlation signal, we see this Fourier peak at pi pi, which is the antiferromagnetic order in the system. As we increase doping here on the x-axis, we see how this single peak breaks up into four peaks, which is more what you then expect for a spin density wave in a Fermi liquid regime. And the breakup happens around 30% around doping in the system. The spin susceptibility, we can measure by, uh, um, um, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So we can just look at the spin fluctuations in a finite region of space. Uh, again, a non-local measurement. And from that deduce the spin susceptibility that shows again, a very non-Fermi li Fermi liquid like behavior initially. And then around 30% doping, it turns into this more Fermi liquid like behavior that we expect here in this high doping regime. Same thing in other correlators. I don't want to go it's, uh, into detail here. But this is uh, just to show you that these higher order correlators give us really the power also to distinguish between theories. So we're comparing here the experimental result of different correlators as a function of doping to various prominent theories in the community. And I can tell you exactly now where which one fits. And uh, it turns out actually that you know, only these higher order correlators have the distinguishing power to reveal the differences between, uh, between those uh, different models and tell us which one is correct when we compare to the data. Okay, I go through this quickly and I come to the end of the talk. Uh, I just want to highlight a bit of the outlook and development challenges. You've seen uh, Antoine's talk on the tweezers. You'll see Michelle Lukin's talks later. You've uh, seen Iron Trap talks. In the field of AMO, quantum simulations, quantum computing, I think we have these three very exciting platforms uh, with very complementary aspects, I would say. Uh, the lattices I showed you today, we're pushing up to system sizes of few thousand particles. Uh, tweezer arrays are in the few hundred particle sizes. Ion traps uh, now approaching this, this 50 atom uh, systems that are in the lab, of course, with different degrees of controllability. In terms of uh, lattices, we're already planning this next step of how to go even larger than that. And that's what uh, Sebastian's team is working on, on building these monolithic cavities where we can have really huge wastes 
to generate the intensities in this monolithic cavity to generate lattices, large volume cavities, uh, large volume lattices that should allow us to take the next step going from few thousand particles to few tens of thousands of particles now with single atom and single site resolution. And of course, something like that could maybe also be interesting for space-based optical clocks or something where you have just a monolithic design that generates you these very high quality lattices in the lab. Um, the next thing that's, of course, interesting for us is programmability. How do we program these systems? I showed you how we use this EMD to make very flexible, versatile optical potentials. One problem I didn't talk so much about and uh, I swept under the rug is if you look very closely at the light field that we make, it's not as nice as we want it, right? So this bottom of the box is not as flat as we want it. And the reason for that is simply laser speckles. So the coherence properties of the light we're shining onto the array basically um, avoid making very nice images as good as, for example, what you get from your projector, uh, you know, when you, when you just use incoherent light uh, on a normal you know, transparency screen. So what we are actually working on also are technical aspects on developing new laser sources, which have uh, high power properties but are basically spatially incoherent. So where we can shine them onto uh, these DMD devices or test targets here and completely avoid the speckle. Uh, so that should allow us to make really high quality potentials where eventually we hope, you know, we can go into those lattices. And if you're a theorist, you tell me, I want this bond to have this strength. I want this bond to have that strength. I want this offset to be like that or that. And we can just program that on the digital mirror device send it onto the atoms and they experience exactly precisely that potential uh, again reconfigurable in the system with these very short lattice spacings of around half a micron in this system. all right uh, that's all i wanted to tell you about today there's a lot of other stuff uh, going on in the group we're working on uh, i just also really want to give credit to the main experiment i introduced to you today our lithium quantum gas microscope and a team working behind that, people doing really the hard work on that. So there's uh, Guillaume who's now uh, moved uh, on, a, on a permanent position to Hamburg University. Uh, Mim is the senior postdoc on the experiment, also leaving us unfortunately soon. Uh, Sarah and Dominic are the new PhD students, also with Peter. Janis did the nice experiments on the transition between the two metal systems, the continuous doping, the polaron. Jaya did the, um, his PhD on the spin charge separation. And the experiment was actually led by uh, Christian Groß, who now moved to a permanent position at, uh, Tübing, at Tübingen University. And uh, I should also say we have a new postdoc from Jean Dalibar's group, Thomas Chalopin, who's taking over. And we enjoyed an extremely fruitful collaboration with uh, Eugene Demler, Fabian Groß, and Annabel Bort on many of the aspects of this Fermi Hubbard model. And with that, I leave you with this nice picture from Munich. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Emmanuel, and uh, thank you for the talk. I think we, we got many questions, uh, some more specific, some more general. So I will uh, start with some specific question on, on, on the talk. So Mehdi Hassan is asking, would you comment on how you can understand physically the different group velocity of all on and spin pairs? Yeah, so I think it's basically this whole, if you look at it, let's go back to the slide. I think it's that, you know, if you want the spin moves at the um, exchange coupling. So if you want to move a spin, let me see. Okay. So if you want to move a spin from here, if you want to make a spin flip from here to here, which would move the green ball here and make the spin on move effectively here, that basically the time scale for that is the spin exchange time scale. And that's given by the exchange coupling uh, J. Whereas if this hole moves, you just have to have a tunneling of this particle here. So here the time scale is just the tunneling of a particle from here to here, which basically for the hole is the same time scale moving in the opposite direction. But here you have the magnetic energy time scale given by super exchange. And they are actually in our experiment in the Fermi Hubbard model set by the ratio of the interaction energy to kinetic energy in the system. So that sets the ratio of T to J. Thank you. Then we have a question from Rizar Dila asking, when you go from the polaron to the crossover regime, what would be the effect of polaron-polaron interaction, if any? 
Yeah, that's what we looked for. So I just urge you, I didn't say I didn't have much time to look into that. That's the exciting question that we're trying to find out about. Sorry, let's just go forward again. Um, are there, for example, bind when we introduce more holes, more polarons, and if we are at low enough temperatures, and actually it seems that from a recent theory paper, it seems that we're not so far away from seeing basically what could happen is that these two polarons bind together. Now there's binding between those two holes. As a precursor to what people then, if you introduce more holes, and I would be at lower temperatures, which could explain, for example, how you get stripe formation and this density patterns that you get in ITC compounds. So this is the essential for uh, mechanism. And that's what we're looking for. And uh, that's why we're looking at, you know, what are the correlation functions of two holes as a function of distance, also depending on the magnetic background. We're trying to see if we can see precursors or effects of, of binding in this, in this crossover regime. So that's what one expects here uh, in this regime over here. Then the polarons completely break down here. It's hard really to say what's going on here. It's a very strange system here until the system remodels and becomes basically a normal Fermi, Fermi liquid metal over here. Okay, thank you. Then we have a more general questions from NKN. So could you tell us how the temperature is measured? Right, so the temperature, we have different ways of measuring that if you are at the lowest temperatures we can reach, there's not much in the density sector we can see because everything is close to unit density. So what we typically look at is next neighbor spin correlators and uh, try to judge from those what the temperature is compared to some benchmark uh, Monte Carlo simulations in the system. So we use spin correlations as a proxy for measuring temperature in the system. And then, well, these are kind of a very uh, question that gives us an overview. So uh, up to you, what are the problems that you can think the optical lattice-based quantum simulator can, can contribute to understand? Well, obviously what I showed today was the big problem of the Fermi-Hubbard model, this kind of reference benchmark problem. I didn't talk at all about uh, Rydberg physics that we're also doing in the system, uh, where you basically now have long range interactions in the system and can study long range interacting um, uh, systems. I didn't talk at all about disordered interacting system, the dynamics of disordered interacting systems. Many body localization, for example, is a big, big modern topic that we have been uh, doing a lot of work on and plan to continue working on to understand those novel dynamical phases of matter where you especially also have non-equilibrium dynamics going on in the system. Um, there are of course other fields that you know people also think you can apply these systems uh, to high energy physics questions, make uh, simulators for uh, quantum gauge theories. Uh, we are also looking at standard gauge theories, uh, artificial magnetic fields in these systems, trying to see whether we can even find new phases of matter. I mean, that I think for any physicist would be the most exciting thing, you know, to really find something new that nobody has predicted before. And I think we can push these systems into regimes where you can, where you don't know what to expect on the one hand, and basically you cannot look with standard uh, setups. So that's of course always a kind of a very exciting direction. Okay, and maybe on the same line, what, what are the biggest biggest challenge that you have to, to overcome in order to go to that direction on in quantum simulation, I think? Right, so I think it depends a bit what you are direction you're aiming. In this problem of the Fermi Hubbard model, clearly we would love to go down in T here, uh, cooling the system more. So we're already getting to an interesting regime, but getting down more here, there should be super interesting physics opening up and super interesting ordered phases uh, that, we, that we should be able to see. Now, that is now difficult to say how low do we have to get in temperature because nobody can solve this problem. So that's a little bit of the problem that we, you know, we know roughly we have to get colder, but by how much is not so clear for some of the phenomena that we, that we aim to see. Yeah. So temperature is one thing, I would say that's definitely a, a big thing for the ground state physics. Uh, as I said, in the end, making these systems um, more programmable, larger size systems, uh, longer coherence times, uh, longer evolution times, coherent evolution times in these systems, this will allow us to explore completely new, new physics regimes and uh, make things more addressable also. So these are all things we, we, are, we are pushing on. 
complementary to these other platforms that you see. I think already from the pictures, you can see the strengths and weaknesses of, of each of those platforms, right? Okay, and maybe really on, on that line, so there, Ian Desper that is asking uh, about the fact that you are running the experiment tens of thousands of time and the cycle time is, uh, the experiment can be quite high. So he's asking how you, uh, which, which kind of improvement you have to do in order to, to speed up? Uh, oh yeah, that's a very good question. I think cycle time is indeed if you, especially if you want to take tens of thousands of data to get this correlation function, cycle time is super important. And right now we are at cycle times of around 10 to 15 seconds for this experiments I showed you. Uh, we hope, you know, by combining the, the tweet, the super fast things we know have learned from the tweezers, super fast loading from the tweezers, that they can be beneficially transferred. And Adam Kaufman has shown very nice ex first experiments in that direction that we might be able to you know, realize these more insulators in very short space lattices where we can use them more for, for quantum simulations and we can speed up cycle times to way below you know, a second to 100 millisecond or 50 millisecond cycle times. That would make our life much easier. Absolutely, very good question. Okay, and still uh, speaking about scaling, can you think about scaling on 3D systems? Like for example, read the read bag atoms are doing. Yeah, I mean we we we, we typically 3D. We st all these experiments started out in 3D. The problem is when you want to basically image a single plane, you basically have to have a depth of focus which is smaller than a single plane. And usually all the background layers, the other layers, they contribute. You know, for such densely packed systems. Remember, these are very densely packed systems. It's not like the nice Eiffel Tower Antoine showed you with the 3D structure, where you have very sparse filling. We're talking about 3D systems where you have a very dense filling on the other planes. So the fluorescent signal they contribute is can be overwhelming. And so you have to discriminate maybe with magnetic resonance techniques, slicing out a single plane, imaging that. Then as I showed you, moving to the next plane, imaging that consequently uh, would be able to also uh, image basically 3D structures, absolutely. Okay, so maybe I will end up this session with the last question from Bill Phillips that they're asking more precision on a question that they did before. Uh, so I read the question. So for further to my question about wanting half up and half down, but getting a distribution on slides, uh, I mean, uh, it said that there was post selection on as MZ equal to zero, which I guess is exactly half and half. Yes. But for large number of atoms, the post selection is really inefficient. How much will it matter that you have exactly half up and half down? Yes. How this, far away you are from it? Yes, that's of course a good question. And for large systems, it should matter, of course, less and less. So you have to do, measure this magnetization and basically normalize it to the system size you're looking at. For the chains I showed you before, then you really want to post select on plus minus one or plus minus two in the system. And we, we can do that. We actually see uh, profound differences sometimes in just adding a single spin up to the system or a single spin down to the system. Um, for actually, for these large systems, what should probably happen in that you, if you have an excess spin up there, you would just, in the 1D case, you would just get an excess spin on in the system, which floats around and uh, you have to discriminate that compared to the other physics that you're studying. So I would say if it's large enough, it's probably be going to be diluted enough if your other effects aren't happening on the single dopant level. Yeah? So if you have many dopants, I don't think that matters a lot. If you're wanting to see the effect of single dopants, you of course have to watch out. You have to be able to post select to that level. It's actually a power that also is not possible in standard experiments. It's, it's a very powerful method to be able to post select the data. So we don't control, that's a good question, Bill. We don't control the filling of these lattices to make each time an experiment with 100 spin ups and 100 spin downs, exactly. Of course, that number fluctuates, but we can go in in hindsight into the experiment and take the data uh, which only has the MZ0 subsector or MZ plus one or plus minus two. But this post selection always has to be done very carefully. Of course, when you post select data, you might be selecting a sub ensemble, which is not representative for the physics. So you're biasing the physics in a certain direction. So post selection is very dangerous. And if you have to be very careful on what kind of quantities you do it, it's usually okay when you do it on globally conserved quantities like magnetization. But uh, otherwise, you have to be very, very careful. But it's also very powerful. 
Okay, so uh, thank you very much for your clear answer. And uh, with that, I give the floor to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much, Imanu, for a very cool talk. Um, of course, I'm a bit biased here, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to also announce our very first young researcher session. It's going to happen on November 5th, and we will have three short talks by you guys. So if you have done something new and cool, please tell us about it. You can find out more about uh, the details of it uh, on our webpage on the nomination. And uh, the deadline to nominate yourself is October 5th. So please hurry up, send us an email. Next week, we'll have uh, Nir Davidson, who will talk about something very different again. So he's going to tell us about how to sell, solve uh, computational problems using coupled lasers. And if you want to get notified of what we do, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our email list, to our Google Calendar. You can follow us on Twitter. And you should certainly check out our sister seminar, the uh, virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they will have uh, Francesca Ferlaino talking about experiments with atoms that have permanent magnetic dipole moments. So, and if you want to join us in the Q&A session continued uh, with Emmanuel, please dial in with Zoom with the link that I just pasted into the YouTube chat. So thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place.